All right, let's talk about a subject that, let's be honest, can sound a little intimidating, biostatistics. But what if I told you it's not really about just crunching numbers in a spreadsheet? What if it's actually about telling stories, really important human stories? That's what we're digging into today, how we turn raw data into real life-saving decisions. And you know, the source material we're looking at today, a textbook for health students, it gets it. It says right up front that a lot of students find this stuff abstract or just plain difficult. But the whole point of this field isn't to be abstract. It's meant to be used out in the real world to solve actual problems. So that's really the big question we're tackling, isn't it? How do you take this chaotic jumble of numbers and turn it into something clear, something that a healthcare worker can actually use to make a difference? It's a journey, and we're going to walk through it together, step by step. To make this all feel a bit more real, let's picture someone. Let's meet a midwife working in a health district in Ghana. She's right there on the front lines, and she's got a really simple but incredibly important question. Are the babies being born in my community healthy? It's a huge question, and the answer, well, it's hiding in the data. And this is what she has to start with. A notebook, and inside, a list of the last 10 birth weights she's recorded. I mean, look at it. It's just a list of numbers. It's really hard to look at this and see any kind of pattern, right? You can't really draw a solid conclusion. This is the raw material, and it's our starting point. So. Here's the first step. Before our midwife can even begin to find the story in these numbers, she has to learn the language. Yep, statistics has its own kind of grammar. And it all starts with figuring out what type of information you're actually looking at. Basically, data comes in two main flavors. On one hand, you have qualitative data. Think of these as categories or labels, like a patient's blood group, or whether a delivery was normal or cesarean. On the other hand, you have quantitative data, and that's all about numbers you can measure. Things like age, temperature, and you guessed it, a baby's weight. Our midwife's list is purely quantitative. Just knowing that is the first key to unlocking it. Okay, so she knows the language. She knows she's dealing with numerical data. Now what? Well, now it's time to bring some order to that chaos. This is the part where we start turning that random list into something that actually begins to make sense. And there's a really clear, systematic way to do this. First, you edit. You just scan for any obvious mistakes or typos. Then you might code the data, maybe assigning one for male and two for female. After that, you classify it, which means grouping similar data together. And the final step is tabulation, which is just a fancy word for putting it all into a nice meat table. And boom, look what happens when you do that. All of a sudden, a pattern just jumps out. Now, we've used a slightly larger sample of 20 babies here just to make it a little clearer, but you can immediately see that the most common weight group is between 2.5 and 2.9 kilos. The chaos is already starting to look like a story. And you know, if a table is good, a picture is often even better. A simple bar chart or a histogram like this makes that pattern so obvious. You don't even have to think about it. Your brain just gets it. You can see the distribution in a single glance. It's simple, it's powerful, and it's so much easier to explain to someone else. All right, so the data is organized. We can see the general shape of it. But a lot of the time, what you really need is one single number to summarize the whole thing, a shortcut, right? What is the typical or the central value for these newborns? And the official name for that idea is measures of central tendency. It's basically just a single value that tries to describe the center of all your data. Think of it like trying to find the balance point for all those different birth weights. And there are three common ways to do this. First up is the one we all remember from school, the mean. It's just the plain old average. You add up all the weights and divide by the number of babies. So in a larger data set our midwife might be working with, the mean weight could be something like 3.05 kilograms. Simple, straightforward. Next, you've got the median. Now this one's clever. If you line up all the weights from smallest to largest, the median is the number smack dab in the middle. For her original list, that's 2.95 kilos. And the superpower of the median is that it isn't easily fooled by outliers, so one really, really big baby or one really, really small one won't mess up the whole picture. And finally, there's the mode. This one might be the easiest of all. It's simply the value that shows up most often. Now, in our midwife's original little list, every number was different, so there was no mode. But in a bigger data set, the mode tells you what the single most common measurement was. Okay, so now we have our typical number. Let's say the mean is 3.05 kilos. But is that the whole story? I mean, what if you had one baby who was one kilo and another who was five kilos? 
The average might still be around three, but that paints a very different picture of community health, doesn't it? And that question right there leads us to the other half of the story. To really understand what's going on, you don't just need to know the center of the data. You have to know how spread out it is. The variation is just as important as the average. This is where something called measures of dispersion comes into play. You can just think of it as a consistency score. Are all the baby's weights packed tightly together around the average, or are they all over the place? This tells our midwife how stable, how consistent the health outcomes are. Two really useful tools here. The range is the simplest. It's just the difference between the heaviest and the lightest baby. But the real workhorse is the standard deviation. It tells you, on average, how far each baby's weight tends to be from the mean. A small standard deviation is exactly what our midwife wants to see. It means things are consistent. A large one, though, that's a red flag. It means there's a lot of variation, and that's something she'd need to investigate. Okay, deep breath. Our midwife has organized her data, she's found the center, and she understands the spread. Now it's time to put it all together and answer her big original question. This is where the two main branches of statistics finally come together. And this is the whole point. Everything we've done so far, making the charts, finding the mean, that's all called descriptive statistics. It does a perfect job of describing the small group of babies she actually measured. But here's the leap. Here's the real magic. Using inferential statistics, she can take what she learned from her small sample and make an educated guess, an inference, about all the babies in her entire district. She can now say with some confidence that the average weight for the whole community is probably around 3.05 kilograms. And just like that, the journey is complete. She started with a messy, confusing list of numbers, but by applying these basic principles of biostatistics, she transformed that raw data into real knowledge. And with that knowledge, she can now make informed, evidence-based decisions that will actually help the mothers and babies she cares for. And that really brings us to our final thought. Our midwife uncovered a story about the health of newborns in her community. But this same process, this same journey from numbers to knowledge can be applied to almost anything. So it makes you wonder, doesn't it? What hidden health stories are out there, waiting in the data all around us, just waiting for someone to come along and tell them?